so we have with us okay. uh, Sébastien Meillard, uh, director at the Institut Jacques Delors. Uh, C'est un plaisir de vous avoir parmi nous. Uh, hello, it's, uh, it's very good to see you. Um, and uh, today's quick chat is about EU's image during the pandemic. And the question is, how did they cope with the disinformation? Uh, so my first question would be that in, in Poland, at least, there were two opposing camps, um, nothing new, by the way, uh, one stating that the EU failed during the pandemic uh, and that only national states can cope with a crisis of that magnitude. Uh, the other side of the political spectrum claimed that uh, health is outside of the treaties of the EU and praised EU's economic response. Um, I would like to ask you, what were the reactions in other member states? Well, I would say both camps have uh, part of the truth there, uh, in a way. And I wouldn't um, uh, answer comparing member states, but rather uh, the answer is not throughout the EU, but in time. That is, I think the impression that the EU had failed was very true acknowledged by almost everyone uh, at the beginning, at the very early stage of the pandemic, when you remember that uh, in the first half of March, we saw national reactions, uh, the commission was nowhere, and uh, the, the, the national borders were being uh, put back uh, without any uh, uh, notification. Uh, and it, it was it really, it was a chaotic uh, reaction. So in that sense, at the early stage, of the pandemic, uh, it, uh, it we can say the EU had failed. But again, I'm, I'm only referring to the very first part of the of this pandemic. And it's true. Why did it had failed? Because uh, first, there is a lack of legal competence for the EU on the public health. Uh, that is true. It's a fact. It doesn't mean that the EU cannot do anything, and we will see that it has done a lot. But uh, it, uh, it's not the, the, the bulk of its uh, competence. And secondly, there was a lack of foresight. It means that this, I think, was a, a bad surprise for almost all countries. Uh, uh, it was underestimated collectively. So in that sense, uh, as, uh, in, in, in that's what the impression that the EU was not helping us, uh, and it's very true in various countries, not only in Poland, at the very beginning. And I think over time, when the Commission realized uh, the scope of this uh, pandemic, the, how harsh would be the recession afterwards, and all the harsh measures that had to be taken, all the different EU institutions, the EU European Central Bank, uh, the Commission itself, uh, and the coordination between member states then uh, took over. And I think now we have a, a much better uh, positive uh, uh, collective response that showed that the EU uh, can uh, act uh, much better when it does it um, uh, together. So I think the, to, to sum it up that the, the, the impression really moved from uh, the beginning with the impression we had uh, early March as we have it today. Right. Thank you for that. So I understand and I think I agree that those opinions about the EU's response changed over time. And my next question would be, uh, do you think we obviously lack data on this, uh, but w what is your impression? Uh, will the support for the European integration uh, change after the pandemic? Are we as Europeans uh, happy about how the EU did its job uh, or the, maybe the disinformation mm. that occurred during the pandemic will have a lasting influence on our support towards the EU? I know this will be different from country to country, but if, if we say we Europeans, what would be your... No, this is, a, this is, a, this is an, an issue, uh, and it's particular, particularly true uh, in Italy. Uh, you know that uh, what I was describing at the beginning, that the, the impression of a chaos at the early stage of the pandemic uh, yes. was uh, almost everywhere. Uh, but uh, the problem is that even if you change things over, over time, the, the first impression has always a lasting effect. You know, so it's, uh, and this is very true in Italy, in the countries that were at the, the countries that were the first hit by the pandemic, namely Italy and Spain, 
uh, they really, especially Italy, had a very bad impression of the EU, and I think it had had a, it has unfortunately, on my, I believe, uh, strengthened uh, the, the the rejection of EU integration in Italy because uh, they had the feeling that uh, they needed really uh, a, the help of the EU in order to get m medical equipment, to get masks, to get uh, mm -hmm. to. They were really asking for solidarity uh, in facing the pandemic. Uh, and they did not have it at the very beginning. Even France and Germany, as you know, uh, uh, stopped some um, uh, equipment to, to go there. And uh, even at the, the very beginning, also the ECB, the European Central Bank, uh, did not uh, respond to it. And we also remember uh, uh, the President of the Commission, uh, uh, von der Leyen, uh, saying that Corona bonds were just a slogan. And then for the first time in history, we saw a President of the Commission asking uh, the public uh, Italian public opinion, uh, sorry for forgiveness for this uh, lack of, uh, of, uh, of reaction at the beginning. So I think in Italy, definitely, uh, it will take time before uh, a, a more positive image of the EU uh, comes. And that is what is at stake today with the recovery fund. We know that in this recovery fund, Italy could get uh, the share, the lion's share, and if they get that amount of uh, grants, uh, we're talking about uh, over uh, 150 uh, million euros. Uh, if they get uh, th that amount, if they get, uh, if, they, if they, it's visible that this uh, money, uh, this grant come from, uh, it's labeled as European money. I think that can change a lot the way uh, they perceive uh, the EU at the moment. But it, it really did. Uh, did uh, it really damaged the public opinion in Italy, and roughly, generally speaking, uh, it did not um, help uh, European integration uh, to, to be uh, better accepted uh, after this pandemic. I wanted to ask you about the European solidarity as well, and you, I think you mentioned both opposing cases because, on one hand, uh, at the very early stage, uh, some member states decided to close the borders for medical equipment. As you mentioned, France did it, uh, Germany did it, Poland did it. So this would be a suggestion that European solidarity is dead. But then on the other hand, uh, we have uh, Merkel and Macron uh, proposing a, a huge recovery fund, which is a, a huge step towards more more integration. So how, how do you see it? I mean, it, will solidarity within within the European Union uh, be something important or is it just a slogan? No, I believe it has become something important. Again, at the beginning, there was a sort of a national reaction that when you're facing something uh, mysterious, it's a matter of life or death. There was a, a, there were many uh, selfish nationalistic reaction just to 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 do our things on our own, and then we realized, for instance, that closing the borders did not help. It it uh, stopped uh, uh, trucks for coming in to to uh, to pro to uh, provide uh, uh, the necessary uh, uh, um, uh, food we need in the supermarkets, or it uh, it, it really uh, did not help also to get the, the medical equipment in. So uh, one of these. Uh, uh, bad reactions were 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 overcome. Uh, I think there is now much more better place for solidarity. And as you mentioned, the the um, what is new uh, for in this crisis compared to previous one is that uh, I think Germany shifted in a way that uh, before it would be have been perceived as uh, the country and you know, big member states that uh, did not. Uh, was not did not understand the necessity uh, to uh, develop uh, uh, solidarity for the recovery of the uh, other uh, economies of the in the EU, and uh, now uh, this has made this shift, which has made possible this uh, Franco-German impulsion uh, and, and impetus given uh, that has then uh, um, uh, helped uh, the European Commission to really put on the table a bold initiative. And if you if you think about it, the fact that the EU European Union itself, in the name of the 27, will go into markets to raise to borrow uh, uh, money in and, and have a new European debt as such, 
this is completely new. And at the last uh, European Council uh, last Friday, the, 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 the summit they had uh, through the other conference, even if we were still not at all at an agreement and there are still big, huge things to negotiate, no country has put now into question the necessity for this borrowing and to have uh, a, a European debt that will then be uh, uh, used for this solidarity. So I think we have, in this sense, made a major step uh, for European integration during uh, this uh, this crisis. Not at the beginning, but at the stage we are now for the economic recovery. I think, at least in some uh, member states, the politicians were trying to tell us that during such a crisis, only national member, strong national states can, can cope with the crisis. Ah. But uh, I hear you saying that this is not true, is it? I mean, the, the EU has learned from its mistake and, and moved forward, uh, hopefully. It's definitely not true. I, I think we the we realized, uh, even almost individually as, as citizens, that uh, in this uh, boat, uh, we're, on the, we're all in the same boat, and that no country, no one single country, can cope with this crisis all by himself. I mean, you may protect yourself for... for I'm not saying that you, you, you have the right to close your borders if you think it's necessary or you can do it in a regional scale for a particular area that is completely understandable. But we realize that when, termed, when, when it comes to finding uh, a vaccine against uh, this, uh, this um, pandemic, when it comes to uh, raising enough uh, means and funds to, to, for the recovery, and we're all in the same single market, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, making common purchases to, to have uh, enough stocks of a mask and every uh, necessary equipment, we, really, we are really interdependent. And no country, no member state, however big or small it is, can claim itself to be able to cope with this all by uh, himself. And I think that's an a, a important lesson. Uh, I think Pope Francis, uh, during this pandemic, uh, that uh, uh, this interdependence was really uh, something that came out uh, almost bluntly uh, during the, this crisis. Mm -hmm. But I think there is, it will be completely false information to claim that we will uh, we will we will um, uh, uh, get rid of this of this of this pandemic just by ourselves. We need common research. We need the common means. The EU is not just. Uh, uh, being in competition between each other, but it means sharing resources. And during the, to fight this pandemic, we need to share more of our resources because not a single country cannot, uh, when it comes to, uh, um, in terms of medical research, in terms of equipment, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, impulsion given to the recovery, we really need to share more our resources together in order to, to get out of this crisis together. And this is what solidarity is all about. Right. I think uh, we have the last 10 minutes left for uh, for the questions from the public, but I, I would like to okay. us, to, us to try and summarize uh, what, what we discussed. And I think um, the best question to, to try and summarize this is uh, the EU after the crisis, stronger or weaker? Um, will we see more of integration or more, more of national states? What do you think? It can become stronger. Because uh, if this uh, recovery fund is really accepted, and we'll know by the end of July, then if we have this uh, huge uh, investment done at EU level for our member states, uh, and we're really talking about uh, trillions uh, for the coming years, yes, the, the, the EU will be stronger, but I'm cautious that it will only be stronger if this European solidarity is visible, understood, and well explained, and, 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 and uh, well, uh, people are well informed of it uh, in all member states. And that uh, you cannot, uh, uh, if member states uh, uh, national uh, sort of take this this uh, European help for themselves and claim it as their own, uh, then of course uh, the EU will not be stronger because it will not have the political support. It's not just a matter of delivering billions. You have to have to give it a political narrative, a political incarnation. 
And that uh, is the, the, the job not only of the European Commission, but of all member states to show that they have succeeded collectively, not just by themselves. Yeah, and I, I honestly think that what um, the pandemic has taught us is that the European Commission needs to be a bit more active. And I saw throughout the, the pandemic, uh, the Commission being more and more active, not only in coping with the pandemic per se, uh, but also more active in informing the citizens of, of, of the EU what uh, the European Commission is doing. And I think that's that's also important because it, it gives us trust in, in, in public institutions. All right, so now, now we have those uh, seven minutes for, for questions from the public. And I actually have a, a very first question from Mr. Piotr Stanisławski. And this is actually a very similar question to what I have uh, here. Uh, written here before. So uh, during uh, the, the pandemic, uh, the, there was a large number of fake news trying to uh, undermine scientific knowledge. Um, and, and in the long run, this lack of trust uh, in science can be very dangerous for, for obvious uh, reasons. Do you think, and this is the, the, the question from Mr. Piotr Stanisowski, that you should recommend introducing school classes on uh, defense against this disinformation? I mean, how, how should we work with the young to cope with, uh, with this information? Well, I will uh, answer as a former journalist. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, uh, over 17 years I've been covering EU affairs and I, I know what the, the, the difficulty it is to get the right information. And I think it, it's right that uh, we need uh, the ability to inform oneself and uh, the willingness to, to, to make the effort to inform, because the information cannot just get to you, you have to look for it. Uh, is, it requires a uh, uh, some education. Uh, I mean, it's part of uh, raising, building a citizen. If you want to have a, a free, well-informed citizen that is has a, is freedom of, a, of, of, of the way to inform itself and have, has a, it's a matter of how the capacity to have a good diversity of uh, information available with a uh, good, and he can check uh, where it comes from and have a professional uh, journalism. Uh, I think you, you need both. You need a proper education of the citizens to, so that they, they really, um, to, to raise this curiosity of, 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 of information and, and be uh, 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 rigorous and, and, uh, and, um, and want to, to, to not just believe the, 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 the first hand uh, information that is given. And, but also, and, be, and also an education to the way you handle social media because it has become a, a very powerful means and where all sorts of uh, disinformation and, and fake news can circulate. So the way you, you use it and, or, and not overuse it. And also uh, there is a responsibility for, for, uh, to train uh, journal journalists properly. Uh, but uh, I think it, it is, there can be, a, there's room for a European initiative at this level, because it's uh, it's uh, we know that uh, uh, newspapers, uh, um, social networks have no borders, and it's uh, they're, they're a common responsibility there. So um, and, and 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 to 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 support the freedom of, of information and the freedom of press is part of the European values. So I, I would certainly favor a, a European initiative uh, in this uh, in this that would go in this direction. Well, I think the, the, the European Commission is uh, is uh, running a program on media literacy. So I only hope that after the pandemic, it uh, it will be expanded. Mm. And this seemed very important here in Poland because we, at least in the public media, we had a very um, one-sided view of EU's response uh, to do the co coronavirus. And uh, I also feel, and our report, um, our analysis shows this that. Uh, those were all also political actors, internal political actors, uh, fueling disinformation uh, about the EU. And this is my next uh, uh, question from, from the public. It's anonymous, actually, but uh, I encourage anonymous questions here as well. Um, do you think that the, the, the European Commission will be more eager, more courageous uh, in responding to Mm, uh, fake news spread by national governments. I mean, we actually saw during the pandemic 
um, government officials mm. um, stating things that were simply not true. And historically speaking, the mm. European Com Commission was very reluctant uh, to, to discuss uh, such things uh, openly. For, for obvious reasons. And do you think this will change? I mean, that at least here in Poland, some people expect this to, to, to change. Um, I'm not so sure. I know the commission, as you said, is always very cautious when it comes to criticizing a member state because it's uh, part of the, of the EU. But on the other side, I'm sure that, and I see that it will be, uh, will, it will uh, react more, uh, strongly and uh, and perhaps uh, use uh, greater means when it comes to uh, dis disinformation coming from the outside of the EU. Uh, we saw it uh, you know, uh, uh, with China and it was uh, the European Commission expressed it directly to, to China in the, in the last uh, uh, EU-China summit uh, uh, this past few days. Uh, and when it, we saw it during this uh, beginning of, of the pandemic, that uh, when uh, China helped Italy, China uh, made, made it a, a, an issue of propaganda. On the contrary, when, when uh, the EU sent uh, in January uh, help to, to China and sent also material, uh, it, it uh, didn't uh, use it uh, as uh, any um, communication. Uh, because it was the request of China not to speak about it. So they saw that they, they I think the European Commission had the feeling that it had been a bit fooled uh, by China on this. And so now I think they will be much more uh, cautious and and, uh, and and want to defend uh, the, the what the EU has done uh, when the, 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 the disinformation comes from uh, our Except. big neighbors, namely uh, Russia or from China or others. But when it's inside the EU, it's always very touchy. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. Uh, it was a pleasure. Uh, our time is now done. And it was a pleasure to, to discuss those issues with you. And have a good evening.